So we arrive at the final sermon in our Fail Forward series, which um, we've been focusing on uh, the life and faith of uh, one of Jesus' closest friends, the fisherman Simon Peter. And we called this series Fail Forward because that is precisely the method by which Simon Peter progresses through his life and his faith. In many different ways, some big, some small, Simon Peter regularly failed. He got things wrong. He mucked up. But instead of being defeated, being crushed by his failure, Simon Peter failed forward. He learned from his mistakes. He grew spiritually and matured as a human being, not because he got everything right, but because from the very moment that he heard Jesus calling him to follow To his dying day, he never stopped moving forward with Christ. Over the past few weeks, we've uh, looked at just some of the specific occasions uh, where Simon Peter failed. We thought about the time when Jesus walked on water and Simon Peter decided to walk on water with Jesus but was quickly overcome by fear and began to sink beneath the waves. We looked at the occasion when Jesus first shared with his disciples that his personal mission was going to involve him, him in being arrested and falsely accused and put to death. Simon Peter was so appalled by this, he tried to talk Jesus out of it and was sternly chastised by Jesus for trying to undermine the purposes of God. And then last time we looked at what happened after Jesus was arrested on three different occasions. As was foretold by Jesus, Peter denied even knowing Jesus, let alone being his follower and his friend. The fact that the New Testament contains these and other examples of how Simon Peter repeatedly failed in his life and faith is really quite important. It says to us that our failures need not define us. It says to us that when we get things wrong, we need not despair because our failures do not disqualify us. From all God wants for us, life in all its fullness. And what is perhaps most surprising of all is it says to us that our failures are perhaps the most profoundly powerful doorway into spiritual growth and maturity for us. Throughout the ages, uh, there have been many Christian theologians who have even argued that without acknowledging and coming to terms with our personal failure, We simply will not make real progress. We'll not ever have any great depth to our faith. The episodes of Simon Peter's growth through failure that we've looked at so far all happened in the the three short years of Jesus' earthly ministry when he was actually walking side by side with Jesus. And it would be easy for us to make the mistake of thinking, well, surely by the time Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter had got all his failure behind him. Surely by then, he was the mature, fully rounded individual. Perfect. But the New Testament makes it very plain that Even after being filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Simon Peter remained on a steep learning curve and still got things wrong. During that first generation of the Christian church, there was one particular very thorny issue over which Peter and his fellow apostles had to wrestle. And if you read through the Acts of the Apostles, the story of the early church, and read through Paul's letters, you cannot avoid noticing that they are trying to discern what to do about the fact that a lot of people who are not Jewish are starting to become followers of Jesus. 
a lot of people overlook the fact Jesus was Jewish. All of his disciples, the first generation of apostles, they were all Jewish. At the point when Jesus ascended into heaven, the only followers of Jesus were Jewish followers of Jesus. They were, they were like a Jewish sect. So Jesus and his first followers were good Jews who adhered to Jewish law, Jewish customs, Jewish rituals. The men had all been circumcised. The men and women worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem or in their local Jewish synagogue. Saturday was their Sabbath day of rest. And they strictly kept all the Jewish festivals and holidays as set out in the Hebrew Bible. They did not eat the food prohibited by the Hebrew scriptures, such as pork and shellfish and meat with blood in it and any food that had been offered as a sacrifice in a non-Jewish uh, temple. It was also deeply ingrained within their Jewish culture that they should limit their contact and their involvement and their mixing with those who are not Jews. In particular, they should avoid the hospitality of non-Jews. They should maintain their separateness. They should certainly not eat at the same table as non-Jews. For Simon Peter and his fellow apostles, these things were just the way it was. It was their culture. They didn't question it. That's just what they'd grown up with. That's all they knew. But then Jesus throws a rather large spanner in the works of all that. Right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, is recorded the so-called Great Commission, in which Jesus gives directly to his disciples, including Simon Peter, just before he ascends into heaven, uh, these instructions, this mission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, said Jesus to them. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Those last two words, all nations, are a translation of the Greek words pan ethnos. It literally means all people groups, every ethnicity of people, every cultural tribe that makes up the totality of global humanity. Go and make disciples of them. So here is the very Jewish Simon Peter, alongside his very Jewish fellow apostles, each soaked in Jewish law, Jewish custom, Jewish ritual, Jewish culture, being sent to share Jesus with the non-Jews, often referred to as Gentiles. That's what, if you ever see the word Gentile, it basically it means you're not a Jew. And it raises for them a whole heap of angst. Did Jesus really intend them to break their own Jewish rules and customs in order to share Jesus with these Gentiles? And when someone who is non-Jewish in their ethnicity and culture does become a follower of Jesus, what does that mean in practice? Does Jesus want all Gentiles to abandon their own laws and their own cultures and their own customs and their own rituals and their own habits and adopt all the Jewish law and culture and customs and rituals and habits? For example, does a male Gentile Christian have to get circumcised? Do Gentile Christians have to set aside Saturday as their day off? Is it okay for Gentile Christians to keep eating the food that they've always eaten? without thinking about it. Is it okay for them to eat pork and shellfish and meat that's been sourced from the non-Jewish temples, which in those days, for many communities, that was like the local supermarket. That's how you got your meat. These were very difficult questions. 
with which the very Jewish Simon Peter was forced to wrestle. And as more and more Gentiles became Christians, two opposing groups emerged within the church. On the one side, there were those who took the view that to follow Jesus properly, a Gentile had to totally abandon all their non-Jewish culture and their customs and their laws and their rituals and their habits and become Jewish in every way. Those who think like this are sometimes referred to uh, as Judaizers and sometimes for obvious reasons they're called uh, the circumcision group. Then on the other side, were those who strongly believed that by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, salvation comes through faith in Jesus alone. That the central tenet of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Gentiles could become disciples of Jesus without abandoning their culture without taking on all the Jewish laws and customs and rituals and laws and habits. And soon after his own conversion, St. Paul, who himself had been a strict Jewish Pharisee, you could not have had someone who was more Jewish in their practice, quickly became the leading uh, apostle to the Gentiles. That's what he termed himself. And he became absolutely convinced that Gentile Christians should not have to take up all the trappings of Jewish law and cultural culture and ritual in order to follow Jesus. And then according to Acts chapter 10, at the same early stage, Simon Peter reaches the very same conclusion. He receives an inspired vision one night in which he is told directly by Jesus, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And following that vision, led by the Spirit of God, Peter then goes and does something totally against his Jewishness. He enters the household of a Gentile Roman soldier called Cornelius. And he eats with this uncircumcised man's family group. This episode in Simon Peter's ministry represents such a massive paradigm shift for the early church that in the next chapter, Acts chapter 11, it's all retold again at length as Peter explains himself to the other apostles. That chapter tells us that when the other apostles found out what he had done, they asked Simon Peter to explain his actions. And chapter 11 of Acts starts like this. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and ate with them. So Peter explains everything that happened to him and for a brief time the objections are silenced. But this is really a highly emotive issue. And it doesn't go away. It just keeps flaring up, bubbling up here and there in the early church. It comes to a head once more in Acts chapter 15 where some were teaching that unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And this results in the first ever council, a church council in history, the Council of Jerusalem. Paul and Simon, Peter and the other apostles are there And they, after talking about it, decree that male Gentile converts need not be circumcised. Now, if the only record of Simon Peter's view on this were that contained in the book of Acts, then we might easily assume that 
Paul and Simon Peter were both equally strong in standing against those who felt that everyone who followed Jesus must become thoroughly Jewish. But in Paul's letter to the Galatians, his angriest letter, we find that despite everything that he has experienced and said in Acts chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 15, Simon Peter was not consistent in acting out how he now believed. And he was particularly susceptible, it seems, to peer pressure when surrounded by those who disagreed with him. And in Galatians 2, verses 11 to 21, Paul talks of a time when Simon Peter travels down from Jerusalem to Antioch, where there is a a church made up largely of Gentile Christians, new converts. And Paul refers, as I said, to to Peter as Cephas, which is... uh, simply the Aramaic form of the Greek name for Peter, meaning rock. And Paul says that when he first arrived in Antioch, Simon Peter did as he had done for the first time in the house of Cornelius. He made it his practice when he first arrived in Antioch to to go and share hospitality, eat with, share table fellowship with the Gentile believers. But after a period of time, some of the circumcision group also arrived in Antioch with their strong views, their conviction about the importance of Christians adhering to Jewish customs. And in the face of these strong contrary opinions, Simon Peter stops eating with the Gentile believers, and as a result, other Jewish Christians follow suit, including Paul's co-worker Barnabas. So overnight, the church in Antioch goes from being this visibly united Christian community made up of Gentiles and Jews, eating, worshipping, working together as one, to being two separate communities divided on ethnic lines. This retrograde step seems to be caused purely by Simon Peter crumbling in the face of peer pressure and not having the courage of his own convictions. And in the face of strong opposition, he fails to stand by what he had come to believe. And as far as Paul is concerned, Simon Peter's taken a backward step away from the gracious work of God's Spirit in that church in Antioch. And Paul's response is biting, he's livid. He refers to Simon Peter as a hypocrite. I opposed him to his face, he says, because he stood condemned when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? It does rather blow to pieces any perfect stained glass image we may have of the Apostle Simon Peter, doesn't it? And yet... This is still the same individual to whom Jesus Christ himself gave the name Cephas, Peter, the rock. Jesus knew what his friend Simon Peter was like. Jesus knew Simon Peter was failure prone, was not perfect. And and even so... This failure-prone individual is the one upon whom, by his spirit, Jesus was building his church. This 
is the ever so human Simon Peter who continually seems to make painful progress which involves taking two steps forward, one step back. So what's the so what for us? Well, if you ever find yourself sometimes getting things wrong, sometimes caving into peer pressure, sometimes being rightly criticised for not living out your convictions, your faith, then have courage because you are in extremely good company. The key to failing forward is not to allow your failures to define you. All the available evidence suggests that Simon Peter took on board, accepted Paul's criticism. He held his hands up. He said, you're right. The New Testament contains two letters bearing the name of Peter, which are traditionally ascribed to Simon Peter himself. The second letter of Peter is thought to have been written towards the end of Simon Peter's life, shortly before he is believed to have been executed by the Romans for his faith in Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Simon Peter speaks lovingly of our dear brother Paul. He, re- he makes a reference to Paul's letters, saying they're quite difficult to get your head round, Paul's letters, but they're good. He's right. He literally says of Paul and his letters that in the, the letters contain the wisdom that God gave him. This is Simon Peter referring to the man who called him a hypocrite. So God gave him wisdom. The evidence suggests that that Simon Peter was not chosen by Jesus because of his failures, but because of his great capacity to love, to relate to people in love, because of his great love for Jesus. Jesus knows that, like Simon Peter, we will sometimes fail. And I suspect that when we fail, Jesus inquires of us. Just as he once inquired of Simon Peter. Not about the details of our failure. Why did you do that? Jesus doesn't do that. He inquires instead of the orientation of our heart. Where are you with me? John 21 verses 15 to 16 records Jesus saying to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Simon Peter said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Loving God, we thank you for the example of Simon Peter. We thank you that you recognize and call the real us, failures and all, to follow the way of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you do not reject us for our failure. 
but you see the orientation of our hearts. And help us by your spirit to grow and learn and mature and move forward with you. Forgive us where we have been hypocritical. Forgive us where we have allowed peer pressure to push us off course. Forgive us where we have been overcome by our own sense of failure. Please help us to keep an honest assessment of ourselves. Please help us not to be overcome by the things we get wrong. Please help us on our good days and our bad days to keep on loving you and to know the comfort of your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.